What's up everyone? Ben Barrows, also known as Random Crown here, back for part four of the $4 Bounty Builder Hand History Review. If you guys haven't seen any of the previous parts, please go back and watch what you've missed so you're all properly caught up. Do a bit of folding until we pick up a hand. And we do so here in the small blind with Ace Jack. And we've got about 22 blinds in our stack. Cut off shippity dips it in, having us and the button and big blind covered. And since we have the most out of all of those other players left, it's only a 22 BB effective shove. And so they're going to be going all in with plenty of worse hands than Ace Jack. Or at least, you know, a range that overall we're faring well against, like a lot of small, medium pairs. Ace-10, maybe Ace-9, like King-Queen, King-Jack, maybe some other Broadways, maybe some suited aces. So, yeah, against that range, Ace-Jack is definitely a call. So we do so. And we are fortunate to ship the flip against pocket sixes. Now we have King-9 on the button. We open the BB3 bets to nearly 3x and we easily fold. There's going to be 3 betting you know, plenty of hands that have us in rough shape, better kings and you know, stronger pairs. And king nine off doesn't really flop that well, like even if they're 3 betting light, you know, it's it's not going to be like the easiest to play against the post. If we were suited, we could consider calling, but yeah, obviously it's just not good enough to go with there. And we have Ace Jack again in the small blind, facing a limp from under the gun plus two. And since they have about 22 BB behind, so 23 total, Ace Jack just plays best as a all-in because it'll be too awkward stack size wise to just like ISO pre like make like four or five X because when they flat we're gonna be out of position and we're gonna whiff the board enough and it's just gonna be kind of tricky to play post so it just makes it easiest to ship it especially since the BB only has about 12 and a half lines so we do so and get it through pick up a okay pot which is a fine result Ten jack suited under the gun plus deuce, and we just ship the bleezies. King queen in the small blind, facing an open from UTG. And a flat from UTG plus two. Cut off three bets, and it's an easy figgity fold. And honestly, we would just fold the first time around if there's no three bet, since under the gun and under the gun plus two's ranges are going to be on the stronger side. Now we have ace queen suited on the button. Facing a open from the hijack. They only have about 20 blinds total, so it's a very easy three bet call. And they just fold instead, which is fine. Pick up a variance free pot. Have ace nine under the gun plus one. And this is just a fold. Too early, and there's plenty of stacks to cover us. Six nine and BB. Facing a open from UTG plus two. We call. Get a four three seven for an inside straight draw and an over, and we peel, calling their 40% pop bet, figuring we have okay enough equity, plus if the turn checks through, we can bluff some rivers, especially diamonds, because we can easily have flush draws in our range. But instead, we just turn the streezy, which makes it nice and easy, and then we just like river to the higher straight, which is extra great because it gives us the absolute nuts. And we decided to just do something tricky and lead for the minimum to induce a 
rays from just air balls. Say they have like 10 jack or, you know, king, queen, you know, something that just, you know, is nothing on this board. If we bet really small, they might think that we don't have that great of a hand, so they could potentially raise us off of it. And so we could get more value this way rather than betting like a more normal bet, like half pot. Because if they had like, you know, an air hand, they're not going to call that, and they're very unlikely to raise it since it looks like we could have a straight or, you know, something decent. But when we bet the minimum, it looks like we could just have like a one pair hand, like ace four, or, you know, just, yeah, like king seven, you know, just like block betting. And, you know, we'll fold to a raise, so that's what we want to represent, so we do so. And they just call with ace five. So we, you know, got pretty much as much value as we could get there. Like, if we had bet half pot, yeah, they might have called, but, um, yeah, they're much more likely to fold because, you know, it looks like we could easily have a straight. So, yeah, we still got some value there, which is fine. I think the way we played it is good, though, because, like, we will get, you know, some value from air there when they have it. The queen eight suited on the button. Standard open. A small one ships it for 10 BB total. And we call since we're getting good enough odds to do so in general, but especially because the bounty factor makes it a really easy call. And they have ace king and they hold, but still the right play. And pocket sevens on the hijack, facing an under the gun open, and we just muck since stacks are too shallow to set mine, and under the gun is just going to be stronger there. Now we have pocket tens. Uh, under the gun plus two, we open, and the button three bets us, and we decide that they could be three betting us light enough, like they have enough air in their range to be three bet folding, plus they will be three bet calling with hands that tens are in okay shape against, like ace king, ace queen, you know, potentially even pocket nines. So even though they'll have higher pairs sometimes, like yeah, we'll get it in good enough the rest of the time, plus they'll fold sometimes, which is huge, and we'll pick up this 100k in the middle and add it to our 278k stack. So we'll pick up nearly a third of our stack, which is a very significant increase. So we just shippity dip it in and get it through. Pick up a healthy pot. We have 9, 10 off in the BB. Facing an open limp from under the gun. Chiggity check. Get an ace-eight-eight, eight, excuse me, ace-eight-ten rainbow. And we just decide to fold into the pot size bet. Whenever players go full pot, they usually have it. You know, and it here would be an ace, you know. Some kind of decent top pair hand that decided to just limp with pre. Like ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack perhaps. So we decided to just muck our middle pair and, you know, just make it easier to play in general. Because, like, if we called here, yeah, it would be pretty awkward, like, on the turn. Like, we're definitely going to fold to a turn bet. And it seems like because they bet full pot on the flop, they're likely going to just bomb the turn. So might as well just save ourselves some chips. But if they had bet a more normal amount, like half pot, we would certainly call. Because then they're going to have more air in their range. And then even when they do have an ace, we have better odds to draw out and make our two pair trips. But they make it easy for us. And just save some chips and move on to the next one. We have jack three in the small blind. And we decided to do something a bit unconventional and just raise here. I know most players here, I guess, would usually fold. Some would limp. But, I mean, raising isn't terrible. Like, if you think the BB is going to fold often enough, like they don't defend wide enough, then it's a fine steal. So that's why we go for it. And they just decided to just go all in over our raise, and we just fold, which is fine. But that's usually why, you know, you don't really raise there so much these days, because people do go all in with a wider range blind versus blind, because they know that people are just going to be stealing that much more often. But that's also why it's okay to try and steal there with worse hands sometimes too, because people won't expect you to have nothing, because they know that you know that they're going to ship over a lot. So it's better to just you know, limp or, or fold those kind of hands. So, you know, if you know that they know that, then it's okay to raise those weak kind of hands because then they won't expect you to have that 
in your range as much, and they'll probably weight more towards stronger stuff. So it's just a game of leveling, but it just depends on what level they're on, so... Yeah. You just gotta evaluate each player, you know, as... You know, you play against them. But, uh, yes, we raised there and got shipped on, but, you know, whatever it happens. Now we have... Ace King under the gun plus one. Shippy did the bleezies. I have King Jack under the gun. And raise, and we get a call from the BB. Get an Ace 3 4 rainbow board. Just C bet. Less than what we made it pre, which is a great board to do so. Ace high rainbow. And our range is more weighted towards an ace. So, yeah, it's just going to see bed because, yeah, I mean, like, we have more aces in our range than they do, so, yeah, it just makes no sense to bet. Take it down. Now we pocket sixes, raise, BB defends, get a queen, deuce, king, rainbow board. We see bet, they call, we shut down on the turn, and just easily fold to the river bet. Yeah, they probably have a king or a queen. They could, you know, have jack 10 or ace 10 or 9 10 for missed straight draws, which would, you know, make it a reasonable call if we could really, you know, weight the range towards a lot of those missed draws. And I think it, you know, it would be an okay call for those reasons, but I think, you know, it's fine to also fold. They're just going to, yeah, show up with, like, you know, top pair, second pair there a lot as well. Now we have 6-4 suit in the BB, facing a raise from the hijack. We defend. Get a great board for our hand. King-4, 10, two spades, so we have bottom pair and a flush draw. So we have a lot of equity. You know, we can improve with a 4, a 6, and any spade. So that's, like, two... Three, five, nine, it's 14 outs, which is like, yeah, nearly 50% to win the hand if they have like a king or if they have like aces. You know, we could still be ahead if they have, you know, like ace jack, ace queen, jack queen, you know, ace nine, whatever like air they're betting with. Um, so we decide to just raise with all our equity and just put some pressure on them. Yeah, this way we don't let them, you know, see the turn for as cheap, you know, especially if they have something like. Yeah, just just complete air like seven eight. You know, we don't want them to just like turn like a non spade seven or eight. So we want to raise here to you know just get them out of the hand. And yeah, I think that it's okay. Yeah, just because we have so much equity. But at the same time, I think it's probably better to just flat because it kind of sucks whenever we get it in against a higher flush draw. Like obviously, if they go all in here, we're calling them because we've already put so much money in the pot and we got so much equity. But you know, they could have like you know, like ace, x of spades, you know, like queen, nine of spades, you know, some sort of higher flush draw. And when they have something like that, we just like have, you know, way fewer outs. We have, you know, only a six or a four. And so, yeah, our equity just decreases a lot. So that's why I think calling is better, but raising is still okay. But at the same time, if you raise, I think it's better to go bigger, make it like 100K, because that sets up a more comfortable turn shove. Because, like, right here, as you see, make it, you know, like, a little under 2.5x what they see bet. And now there's 200k in the pot, and we have 271k behind. So it's, like, a little too much to shove. I mean, it would be okay, but, you know, not optimal. So that's why if you make it 100k and they call, then there's, you know, probably, like, yeah, 260, 270 in the pot, and then we have, like, 230-ish behind. So then it's a much more reasonable shove because, you know, it's a little less than a pot size bet. But, you know, I mean, it's, this is still fine, but, you know, we're just analyzing things from a GTO perspective so you guys can, you know, really make the best plays when you're playing. And we get a 10 on the turn, pairs the board, which is no bueno for our hand, because they could easily have 10x here, so this really slows us down, you know. Our equity has decreased significantly. A 6 changes nothing now because, you know, the board is paired. And, you know... We could still bank a 4, but it still might not mean anything if they already have a 10. So yeah, we just are kind of putting on the brakes now and hoping they check back and we can see a free riv. But instead they bet, and we're just getting direct odds basically to call and, you know, bank our flush or boat. Yeah, I mean, they're betting 70k into 200, and so then there's 270, basically it's 70 for us to call to win 270. So we're getting about 4 to 1. And that's like exactly what you need to just bank your flush. Plus, we have the two outs for the four as well. So yeah, we're just getting direct outs to call. So we do so, and fortunately, bank our flush on the river, and we just jam it in, hoping that they have a ten, and we'll just pay us off. 
and they do so, but they actually just river the straight. So that's great. And we should be up a very significant bot. Looks like we just want a pot. A few hands go. What happened, guys? Oh, 5 3 suited? What happened here? Okay, so we open. Actually, it looks like we just play another pot. What happened? Oh, no, we don't play the 7 8. Okay, that's a 5-3 suited. What happened here, guys? Wait, uh, did we play the 5 deuce? Is that what happened? Yeah, okay, what happens here, guys? 5 deuce. And we just fold that, and we just get 5-3 suited. So weird, you see that? Like, we just had, like, 700k. 740. And then... Next hand, we have 648. There's some missing hands in here, guys. I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened this tournament, but it looks like perhaps the internet went out, and I was like sitting out for a while or something, and it blinded me down. Yeah, I couldn't quite say. I've never seen this happen before, but you know, whatever. I mean, doesn't really affect things too much, but yeah, it's yeah. I wonder where those chips went. Well, regardless, yeah, I guess we we open this five three suited here. Two point five x under the gun plus one, and we just do so because we're at a table full of more amateur players, and they're not going to play back at us enough. So we can just open wider because we'll have more of a post flop edge. And we get a couple calls under the gun plus two and the cutoff. And I think probably that we open because the small blind had a decent bounty. So it encourages looser opens, you know, when players yeah just have bigger bounties. And we get a three seven ten board. Bottom pair with a backdoor floosh draw. And we bet a little more than a third pot. And get a call, and another one. Turn a straight draw, but it's not good enough for us to barrel since someone's probably got 10x and it's not going to fold. But they just check it through. We get an 8 on the river, and magically win the pot with bottom pair because they both had missed flush draws. Yeah, this is a pretty pleasant surprise. <laughs> King nine off here. In the BB, facing a min race from UTG plus one. We defend. We queen queen four to spade board. They see bet. We easily fold. We have a six ten in the small blind. Folds to us. We just limp this time. And get a five deuce eight. To heartboard, we just min bet to hopefully just get them to fold whatever random two cards they had in the BB, but they call, and then we turn an open ended straight draw, so it's good enough equity to barrel. So we do hoping to get them to fold like a five or a deuce, and we get it through. And on that note, we will conclude part four of the four dollar bounty builder hand history review. Hope you guys learned a thing or two. See you guys back for part five.